We're doing this inspection of the Gorton Forest estate property. It's just northwest of Newcastle in this really lovely area of very topographically complex uh, kind of ridges and ranges. It's got several creeks that run right through the property that are all flowing beautifully at the moment after the wet summer that we've had. The property is really exciting because although it covers just under 4,000 hectares, the topography means that there's a lot of diversity within that. So there's lots of different eucalypts, there's patches of rainforest down in the deeper gullies, and we think it'll be home to a, a really huge diversity of wildlife. So we're interested in koalas, gliders, possums, and a lot of things that aren't found currently on other AWC properties. So it's really exciting. We know the property does support some threatened species and we expect that once we are able to get our boots on the ground here and start to do some survey work that will uncover a whole range of really exciting and amazing species that, that this place provides really important habitat for. The koala just recently declared as an endangered species in New South Wales so we hope that this will become a stronghold for that species. Some other things include spotted tailed quoll brush-tailed fasca gale, squirrel glider, possibly long-nosed potteroo, various other small mammals. It really is um, quite an amazing place with really dense understory vegetation. So we expect there'll be a whole suite of small native mammals um, that call this place home. Very high conservation value and we'll be able to um, protect and conserve a wide range of plants and animals. This will be a really new and exciting and unique um, addition to the land that AWC owns and manages. I have to announce that Gorton Forest is AWC's newest sanctuary, a property in New South Wales. And to talk to us all about this brand new project, I'm joined today by Aled Hoggett. Um, Aled, welcome to AWC in Conversation. Thanks, Joey. And uh, just as a bit of background, would you mind telling people what your role is and the area that you're responsible for in AWC? Yeah, sure. Um, my current role, I'm the Regional Operations Manager for Southeast Australia for AWC. And that means I have a responsibility for AWC's conservation operations across the whole of the, the Southeast estate. Um, I'm also at the moment just transitioning out of a position, a similar position I held in the Kimberley as Regional Operations Manager for Kimberley. Um, and up there, I had the privilege for three and a half years of managing AWC, you know, the broad sweep of country that AWC is involved with in the Kimberley. Mm. So um, very big roles, looking after a very large uh, portion of the country in, in various positions. Um, in New South Wales, this is a completely new project. And this is a region where AWC hasn't had, uh, you know, major projects of this scale previously. We haven't worked in tall eucalypt forests in the southeast until now. Just to put it in context, can you tell us about where this property, Gorton Forest, is and how it fits into the broader region of the southeast? Yeah, thanks, Joey. I, I can, and it, this property has a bit of personal significance to me. Prior to coming to AWC, I did work for 20 years on the mid-north coast, um, ran my own farming business, and the, and the property is very close to that. But it's an important property for AWC because it puts us in a new bioregion. Uh, the New South Wales North Coast bioregion, where currently we, we don't have any properties. And in fact, if you look at AWC's property portfolio across Australia, um, you know, apart from North Head and, and Curramore, there's really not much, and those are both relatively small properties, there's, there's not much in the coastal strip of, of uh, you know, southeastern Australia. Um, our other properties in New South Wales and indeed most of our properties in Queensland as well are, are, are sort of more remote and more arid until we get up into the tropics. So it really is um, an area of Australia where AWC hasn't got uh, strong representation, I guess you could say, and, and so it adds a very important dimension to AWC's over, overall conservation portfolio. Mm. You mentioned um, bioregions and that's um, people might not be familiar. It's a way of classifying basically ecosystems and landscapes in Australia based on a common suite of vegetation types and landforms. Um, and that's one way that we can prioritise where we work across Australia, trying to get the maximum representation of biodiversity across our sanctuaries and partnership sites. What about the 
the condition of the landscape at a, a broad scale, um, how much forest is left and, and where does this property fit within, within what is left of that vegetation? Well, this, this property is uh, very important. Um, and you can see the slide you've put up there, uh, the position of the property in the overall landscape. It forms part of a, of a crucial corridor that runs all the way from the coast up to the World Heritage listed Barrington Tops. And the Barrington Tops, of course, is, is part of a, a long strip of, of coastal hinterland forest or mountain forest that runs all the way from Melbourne to Brisbane. And in conservation terms, that strip of forest is incredibly important. The continuity of that strip of forest also is important. Um, the connection between the coast and, and the Barrington Tops, uh, of course, is, you know, in, in co conservation context is, is crucial, uh, linking linking the ecosystems. Um, but the Barrington Tops themselves are also really quite important because they're, they're just north of the only break in that forested strip from Melbourne to Brisbane. And that break, of course, is the Hunter Valley. So in a regional context, this corridor uh, and this area, very important in terms of overall conservation. AWC is really excited to be working in this new bioregion. What do we bring by establishing a new project like this in, in that North Coast bioregion? Well, I think AWC brings a new dimension to conservation in any area where it operates. Our conservation model is, is, is active. Um, you know, it gives us the, Gorton and, and all of our properties give us the opportunity to demonstrate our dy dynamic approach to achieving effective conservation outcomes. And Gorton is particularly good because there we offer a progressive alternative to more conservative um, approaches to conservation or traditional approaches to con uh, conservation in the properties that surround us. And you mentioned, uh, yes, we back onto National Park at Gorton. Uh, there's also significant areas of state forest and then on either side, uh, private land uh, that are, that's managed for conservation as well. So it, it gives us the opportunity to show a different approach, to show AWC's approach in the context of those other approaches. Mm. That will be very exciting. We know that, you know, there's a sort of really important assets in terms of conservation on the site. So we'll come to talking about the vegetation and some of the threatened species. Um, but another factor that made AWC really excited about this was the uh, the closeness closeness to major population centres. So opportunities for engaging with the public, with educators, you know, for things like school groups, and also with with media. How do you think this property could act as a kind of showcase for the work that AWC does around Australia? Uh, I agree, Joey. You know. An engaged community is absolutely crucial to the sustainability of AWC's conservation efforts across the whole of Australia, but indeed fundamental to, to conservation. Um, the idea of locking places up and keeping people out as a, as a method of conservation, I think, is, is fundamentally flawed. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the reasons why I'm really excited about this property. I know the area well. It is close uh, within easy distance of Sydney and Newcastle, two major population centres, but also really easily accessible from the Hunter Valley and the Mid-North Coast. And both of those areas are also areas where population uh, is growing quite quickly. But I also think it shows the power of, of conservation in those more populated landscapes. Um, and so not only do we get the benefit of being able to show people what we're doing, but we get the benefit of being able to show people how you can integrate conservation with people, basically. And I think those those two things are, are absolutely vital. Mm. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. I think the, the scope here for, you know, hosting those different groups of people who are interested, of the general public, um, you know, we expect visitation will play a key role at this place. Obviously, it'll, it'll take time to develop those programs. But yeah, that's, that's extremely exciting, I think. Mm. Uh, a little bit about the property itself then. You've been on site a few times now in, in some of the inspections and the preliminary work that we've done there. Can you tell us a little bit about the landscape? So as you're driving in, you know, what do you see when you're approaching it? Well, it's in a beautiful part of the world and I say that without any bias, um, but no, it is, it's a truly, the, you know, the mid North Coast, uh, the North Coast of New South Wales is acknowledged as, as a, just a, a, you know, a, a beautiful place to visit. Um, it's just outside the little village of Stroud, uh, and uh, and you travel through through, through some old dairy country. Um, but 
on either side of the valley uh, are, are these forested landscapes. And you could see that from the slides you put up before. Uh, when you arrive at the property, the property itself is completely forested. The forest just cloaks the hills uh, and, and you enter into it, you know, through gorgeous forests of beautiful coastal, uh, you know, coastal trees, things like Sydney blue gum and tallow wood and, uh, and, and things like smooth barked apple. There's, there's a whole diversity of, uh, of spectacular trees. But essentially, it's a great example of, of typical coastal hinterland forest. Um, it's got a very diverse topography, as you, you indicated in the, in the video intro, and that gives us a, a wide range of potential ecological niches, uh, which is expressed in the landscape as a, a wide range of vegetation types. And this is reflected in, uh, that's, that's a really good example, just the, the vegetation types on the screen there, this really intricate pattern of vegetation across the property. Um, and as you mentioned before, you can see on three sides, the the, prop, the the vegetation is continuous. So it's surrounded by similar forests, similar habitats. It's protected and embedded in those. And so when you get into Gordon, it's a very large property in its own right, but it feels almost infinite because of the surrounding vegetation. And uh, when we look at the types of vegetation we have there, you know, there are deeply incised gullies and, and creeks supporting rainforest. And it, it grades through wet sclerophyll forest right up to dry sclerophyll grassy understory forests on the ridges. And of course, it's, it's in great condition. Uh, and it's in great condition because, you know, for thousands of years, it was managed by the traditional owners. Uh, and since the movement of Europeans into the area, first with the Australian Agricultural Company, and then, uh, you know, with a whole range of other people who've moved through, this property has been forested the whole time. It was never cleared. Uh, and though it was logged uh, primarily post-war, for the last 50 years, it's been owned by a, a, or managed by a single person who's, who's taken an extremely conservative approach to the management of the property. And what that leaves us with is, a, is vegetation across the whole property that is both floristically and, and structurally diverse. So there's a broad range and types of plants, you know, from our understory shrubs and grasses and and, uh, and and our overstory trees through to vines and, and things like that in the rainforest. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, and of course that all creates ecological niches. All the variety creates that, that infinite variety of ecological niches and the opportunity for, for animal species, which are the primary focus of AWC's activities uh, to, to exist. Yeah, I mentioned uh, in the video some of those arboreal mammals that we're especially excited about um, on a couple of the trips up there spotlighting. We've seen greater gliders and short-eared brush-tailed possums, as well as, you know, the evidence of threatened species like yellow-bellied gliders. They're fascinating possums. These are um, part of the group of gliders that feed on sap, so sugary exudate, it's called the sap that flows out of particular species of eucalypts and grey gums are one of the species that they they target in particular. So they're closely related to sugar gliders and squirrel gliders. And yellow-bellied or fluffy gliders chew these quite distinctive chevron shape incisions in the bark. So they'll come along at night time with their, their sharp uh, lower teeth, chew this, this scar and then come back on subsequent nights to feed on the sap. And that's, you know, very energy rich, sugary food for them. So we, we saw evidence of this on a number of the grey gums through the forest set there. So it's, it's pretty exciting to think there's significant populations of threatened species like the yellow belly glider. Also on some of those first inspections, we found threatened frogs. So literally, you know, that we've only kind of entered the property and after about 20 minutes, we'd found giant barred frogs. So these are Australia's second largest species of frog. Um, really incredible looking thing with big golden eyes. I've got a picture of him too. Um, and then also the green thighed frog. So working in a place where, you know, these things were literally in front of us as soon as we, we got onto site was, was very, very cool. We also have confirmed records of the glossy black cockatoo um, and a couple of other threatened birds, masked owl and sooty owl, so they're confirmed on site. And then bats, there are um, quite a few micro bats, insectivorous bats that have been recorded there. So they include large bent wing bat, greater broad-nosed bat. I hope we've got some bat fans on the call. 
Um, the, the bigger one, grey-headed flying fox, is a threatened species. Um, and we may also have golden-tipped bat, which is a, a fascinating one that uses abandoned nests of scrub wrens. So they actually chew into the bottom of these scrub wren nests and use that as their roost. So really fascinating species. And I know that they're one of the most interesting insectivorous bats for me anyway. Yeah, so lots and lots of threatened species. I guess that brings us, Alad, to what are our priorities as we're setting up a new project like this, uh, you know, across science and land management and operations, what do we need to do over the next 12 months and beyond to get this set up as a sanctuary? Well, yeah, good question, Joey. And uh, at, the, at the moment, I guess what I would say is that we're in the phase of coming to understand the property. Uh, and for for me as a land manager, that particularly includes things like coming to understand uh, what the what the situation is with weeds and feral animals, uh, the infrastructure that's available on site, um, and developing, starting to develop relationships with our neighbours, with other stakeholders in the region, and particularly uh, reaching out to traditional owners as well, and and looking for opportunities to engage more bro broadly in the community and with with the traditional owners. Um, and I think for science, it's much the same. We have a, a current species list, which I think is about 145 species of, of mammals, amphibians, uh, birds and reptiles. But I think uh, once the work begins in earnest with the science team, they'll, they'll extend that list fairly rapidly. And then we have to make the longer term decisions about how we're going to manage this. And what AWC brings to the conservation landscape that, that other conservation organisations generally don't is a very active approach to trying to create conditions that are, that are better for conservation outcomes. So that's that dynamic approach I was talking about before. But we're right in the early phases of all of that uh, at the moment. And while some of the problems or some of the challenges that we encounter are, are fairly obvious, like you know, there are certain places where we've seen infestations of weeds, particularly associated with roads and things like that, um, some of the opportunities won't become available until we really uh, you know, delve in and, and start to get the hard data uh, and spend time on the ground and really come to understand the place. And then, of course, there's the, the further aspect of community engagement and, and how, do we, how do we do that? How do we maximise that? Um, and I think, once again, that will only, only come with time on the ground, uh, with making contact with people, uh, with looking at the opportunities that the property presents. So in some ways, it's a, it's a beautifully formed piece of natural ecology. And in other ways, it's almost a, a blank canvas for AWC in terms of, in terms of opportunities. Um, it's a very exciting stage to be involved in a project like this. In terms of how AWC came to be working on this property, we're very lucky and very grateful for the support of two generous supporters, uh, Jane and Andrew Clifford. Andrew Clifford is one of the directors on our board. And as philanthropists, Andrew and Jane have enabled the purchase of this property for AWC. So something that simply couldn't have gone ahead without their incredibly generous uh, support. So we're, we're very grateful to Jane and Andrew for that. That's a, a great overview, I think, Alad. And, you know, I think for our ecologists, you know, they're going to be like kids in a candy shop trying to, uh, you know, work out what's here, build that inventory of, of species and grow the species list, as you described. A little bit more about the infrastructure. So there are some roads through the property. What are the, what's the condition of that infrastructure at the moment? Is there anything that needs, you know, major work? Um, and what about buildings? Are there buildings on the site? Yeah, so the having been a, a property that has been used for, uh, for forestry historically, the road and track network in Borton is very good uh, and it's been well maintained. And, and that's important because uh, roads and tracks do give access and, and that is a double-edged sword, of course, but they can also become real problems if they're not properly looked after. So that's one of the, the, the good things about this particular property is that they have been well looked after um, and that gives us opportunity to access uh, across the property in future we'll need to review the network as it currently stands and see whether they all need to remain open and whether we can um, you know we can streamline that network uh, but that is an important part of you know having access to the property and particularly if we're talking about engagement opportunities there's also a, a cluster of older buildings including a lovely old home uh, on the site, but they're right 
pressed right up against the, the western border um, on a creek uh, close to the road. So essentially, uh, apart from the road network, only a very small part of the property was ever cleared. It's, it's just a matter of a few hectares, a handful of hectares around the house site. And uh, yeah, the, the legacy building, buildings themselves are, are quaint and uh, you know have a little bit of historic value, but uh, they're not a big impact on the overall site. Mm. I've just realised too, and sorry, I'm jumping around a bit here, but we uh, omitted one of the threatened species of which there are important records on the property, and that's the koala, which of course has been recently listed as an endangered species in New South Wales. Um, we've got this map here showing areas of significant habitat for the koala in New South Wales. Could you talk for a little bit about uh, why or how this property fits into those areas of significant habitat? Well, I think it's safe to say that the locality is, is well known as a significant habitat for koalas, and that's been recognised by the New South Wales state government. The map you have there is uh, the pink areas are those areas that the, the government has recognised as state significant koala habitat, and Gordon, as you can see, falls right in the middle of that. Um, so we also know from, from looking at, you know, information that's publicly available on government databases that the, the area around Gorton supports very significant uh, populations of koalas, and there are records of koalas on Gorton itself in that, in that public database. But we know that's not the full story because there's been surveys done on Gorton by state forests and by some of the mining companies looking at offsetting um, that have also identified koala populations. So we're, we're, you know, we're very confident there's, there's plenty of hard data and anecdotes on Gorton and also surrounding Gorton. The hard thing on the coast is to actually see them because the trees are tall and, uh, you know, koalas aren't particularly dynamic. Uh, they're very difficult to spot from the ground. But we do have, uh, as I said, plenty of evidence, sightings of koalas and, and plenty of evidence of koala activity in the, for in the property itself and around. So that, uh, as the regional ecologist Greg mentioned in the intro video, um, they've recently been listed as an endangered. We know there's all sorts of pressures on koalas. This particular area is one of the one of the strongholds for koalas in the state, which makes the property even more significant. Yeah, very exciting. And um, there'll be a prize for whoever spots the koala. <laughs> <laughs> the first koala. Uh, I, I want to just bring our audience's attention to the fact that all of this work is thanks to your generous support. I talked about Jane and Andrew, who enabled the purchase of the property. We're also grateful to another generous supporter who has put up $500,000 as part of a matching challenge to raise a total of $1 million to support management of this new sanctuary for the first year of operations. You can click on that link and it will take you to AWC's donation page. We've got our Christmas campaign up there at the moment, so you can select a gift, a donation as a gift um, on behalf of someone else and they'll get an e-card about that gift or you can choose to donate to support this exciting new project at Gorton Forest. Uh, click on the link and support this work if you can. Now I'll come to some of the questions that have popped up. Thank you for everyone who's been engaging there. The one that's come up a couple of times here, uh, Alad, is are there any plans for a fenced exclosure to um, you know, exclude cats and foxes from any part of this property? Is that something we would consider at Gorton Forest? It's a good question, Joey, and there's been a bit of discussion about this. As I said, Gorton, in terms of in terms of our conservation actions, is in some respects a bit of a blank slate at the moment. And certainly, we've been talking about the possibility of offence disclosure. There's some very practical considerations. This is very challenging topography for fencing, um, and we'd also have to be quite clear about why we were putting it in. But in talking to the regional ecologist, Greg's mentioned that there's a there is a suite of, of uh, smaller matropods in particular uh, that are missing from from the forest, and that is one of you know that's part of what AWC could potentially bring. Uh, to the landscape. But at the moment, that question isn't resolved. And as I said, there'd be some pretty major technical challenges for my team to get that fence in place and keep it maintained. We've also had a couple of questions about weeds, uh, about what are the, you know, the major weeds of concern based on our, our initial understanding of the property. And then also what in general across our sanctuaries, how do we, you know, detect and then manage weeds um, quickly and in a way that gets on top of them before they're able to spread? It's a very timely question, 
Joe, because as you're aware, we've just released our national weed strategy and we're starting to write individual weed strategies for all of our, our properties. Um, and we have a very, uh, I guess, comprehensive and systematic approach to managing weeds. Uh, and we'll, we'll roll that approach out on Gorton. Uh, and it's, it's not only, you know, it, it acknowledges that some weeds are, are likely to be a long-term part of our landscape and, and, uh, and other weeds are eminently eradicatable. The major weed in coastal New South Wales in forests is lantana, and certainly lantana is present on Gorton, but the control methods for lantana are reasonably well established. And as I said, weeds are generally only a problem in forested landscapes where this, historically there's been significant disturbance. And that's why they tend to be associated with things like roads, which uh, when, you, when you're maintaining drainage structures on roads and maintaining the roads themselves, um, that's when you get the disturbance that enables the weeds to thrive. Um, we, because Gorton has been very lightly logged, there's never really been the opportunity for the weeds to work themselves out into the landscape uh, as you get with more aggressive logging techniques that sometimes occur in other places. So I'd say in, in terms of overall weed burden, Wharton is, is relatively, it's, put it this way, I'm not losing any sleep over our ability to get on top of the weeds at Gorton. There's, uh, you know, there's, there's well-established techniques and, and we know, you know, the, the location of most of those weed populations and the vectors that are spreading them. And we'll just work systematically in order to, uh, you know, in order to make sure we keep them under control. Uh, any other feral animals present on the property that are of concern? We haven't done any surveys at this stage. Um, I've talked to the previous owner and obviously I've managed very similar country myself for 20 years and we know that there's likely to be dogs, uh, there's likely to be, and I mean, I mean feral dogs rather than dingoes, uh, there's likely to be pigs, um, there's potentially maybe deer, um, but we also know that they're probably going to be at relatively low densities. Um, there'll also be cats, uh, and, and I guess that will be the question is, you know, that's part of the process of getting to know the property. Because we back on to, to both state forest and national park, and both of those areas will have active feral animal control programs, we're not anticipating that there'll be significant feral animal issues. And indeed, in talking to the previous owner, you know, he's, he's aware of feral animals on the property, but he's never seen, uh, you know, significant activity, activity that would concern us as conservationists. Look, I think that's been a, a fantastic conversation. I realise there are a few questions that we haven't addressed, but we've run out of time. If you'd like to learn more, please get in touch with us at Australian Wildlife Conservancy. We'd love to tell you about this project and our plans for the property, as well as all the, as well as all of the fantastic wildlife that's found there at Gorton Forest, uh, north of Newcastle in New South Wales. Alad, thank you for taking the time to tell us about this really exciting new project. Yeah, no problems, Joy. And I'd just like to add to what you said before. Um, I've worked for AWC for three and a half years now. I've run my own business. I've worked for bureaucracies. I've worked in private enterprise. Every day when I head out to, to do my work, I'm deeply conscious of, of and deeply grateful for the generosity that makes our work uh, possible. So I'd just like to add to what you said. We are, all of the staff are conscious of, of the generosity that make our work possible it's unique work uh, it's wonderful it's a wonderful pr privilege to be involved and it's been great to be able to share it today thank you so much for your time and thank you to our audience and our, our viewers today for all joining us for this webinar it's it's very exciting work so we're, we're keen to get stuck into it don't forget you can support our work at australianwildlife.org we couldn't do any of this without you i'll leave it there thank you and talk to you again next time